You are listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. Welcome to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Hampton. My Unusually Well-Informed guest today is Leanne McAleer. Leanne is an award-winning facilitator, speaker, writer, and consultant. She is a program director and sought-after lecturer at the Schulich Executive Education Center at York University. And she is a featured speaker with the National Speakers Bureau. Today, Leanne and I are discussing how organizations and leaders can develop and pursue a mission and create innovative products and services. Leanne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. I'm really, really happy to be here. I My have pleasure. To tell you, I watch your uh, podcast regularly, so I am really delighted to be uh, included in oh, your. That roster. feels wonderful. Thank you so and much. You're welcome. So let me let me start with um, sort of a, a high level question and ask: What is it that drew you to a career helping leaders innovate? It's a great question. Uh, let me start here. Um, I began. I began my career, uh, my business career out of university. I started working with uh, Xerox, um, at a time uh, when Xerox had the best training of all kinds in the world. They were state of the art in terms of sales and marketing training, and uh, I went particularly for that. Uh, I then became a sales manager. Um, I loved the role. Uh, I wanted more control, so I moved into a. Um, I uh, owned a company with a partner, and we worked in an entirely different area. And we uh, had this capability of trying new things. <clears throat> so, uh, for many years, we developed our own way of training people. We developed our own way of uh, servicing our clients. It was really really interesting. Uh, and then what I found was there was in me uh, a growing uh, requirement. Like uh, I was much more attracted to the business of learning than I was to selling what I had been selling. So I moved uh, into the consulting and kind of learning and development space. So that's going back some decades. Uh, when I did that, uh, I discovered at the time that there was um, very little space in organizations. People talked about innovation, but there really was a very little training. There was very little discipline attached to the business, et cetera. And so uh, it, was, it was like the sweet spot for me. So that's where I kind of focused. And as a result, I've worked globally. Like I've worked in 32 countries. I've been in, you know, 422 airports. We know what that's like. <laughs> and uh, really, you know, when people talk about how much they travel for business, uh, I know exactly what that means. And it means that you've been in so many hotels, you can't tell them apart. Right. Uh, but, the, but the reason um, is because it is um, a discipline that's deeply misunderstood. And so why do I like to work with leaders around it? Because I've been there, I know what it's like, and um, it needs a great deal of um, surround sound of uh, supports and systems to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting work. And I'm really uh, fascinated by leaders who take it on. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a fractal topic that you'll never get bored. Yeah, impossible. Yeah. Which nice. airport can you see the Eiffel Tower from? I can't remember. <laughs> the goal, I think. <laughs> Probably neither. Maybe when you're on the on approach, but <laughs> right. Um, so you you've talked about in, in other forms, you've talked about innovation being a strategic imperative. Mm -hmm. And you've just referred to it as a discipline. I'd like to sort of break those because I don't think anybody would disagree with you, but mm -hmm. I think that. Um, we might want to talk definitions a little bit. So can you break okay. down why you think it's strategic and why you think it's imperative? I can. Um, so uh, why I think it's strategic and why I think it's a discipline, those two. Topics. Uh, well, and imperative, actually. And, well, imperative, I think that um, uh, you can't breathe today without recognizing that we have to do things differently and we have to add value in new ways, right? We, um, so the imperative uh, is driven by uh, 
not only the externals about which we're all really familiar with, which we're all pretty familiar, uh, but also the internal changes that have taken place for people. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting time. It's like a vortex, right? So there's external forces and there's internal forces. And um, I'm struck by, you might um, remember this quote, but many years ago uh, at the kind of start of the, the, the change into people adopting new ways of doing things. Um, Jack Welch, G, said, um, when the rate of change externally is uh, bigger than the rate of change internally, you're in trouble for sure. You just don't know when. Right. And I think with COVID, what happened, the when hit in a really big way. For sure. You know? So the imperative is uh, the forces that are both internal and external for people. Thinking about innovation strategically, is it a strategic imperative? The answer is yes, because uh, if you look at the business plans of most organizations, they are demanding, right? They expect a great deal. And if you look at that, you recognize that it can't be achieved doing what you do. In, you know, do you know what I mean? So um, there is a re- so the the role of innovation really is as an enabler of strategy. Right, right, right. And, well, and that's and I think I'd like to sort of challenge that. Not that what you're saying, but the 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 idea that it's happening commonly. Um, <laughs> that when you when you say that uh, uh, innovation is an enabler of strategy, the implication is that strategy is trying to go from A to B. But it seems to me, especially, and this has been betrayed, I think, by COVID, is a lot of companies want to stay at A. And they were forced to be because of COVID. And now they'd very much like to go back. Well, this is really interesting. So uh, it's a really interesting question. And I'll tell you uh, from my perspective why. Uh, the desire to go back uh, is driven by a comfort with the status quo, mm-hmm. right? I mean, um, you're right. I have talked to leaders who say uh, when things go back to normal and uh, I am uh, complete like, okay, my husband says I have a face like an emoji, right? So that when I'm surprised, like no poker face, there's no poker face here. I would lose money all over the place. Las Vegas is not my town, but um, the going back piece uh, has a definite pull because I know how to function in that, in that world. Mm -hmm. And this one is entirely changed. So what's interesting from my perspective is the tie in with a certain kind of generation of leader, if you will, or, you know, or um, maybe even a stylistic kind of piece attached to the the status quo and um, the changing demographic. So um, I remember talking to a colleague of mine and him, him calling out that by 20 uh, 25, 70% of every workforce is going to be a combination of millennial and Gen, Gen Z. Mm-hmm. 75%. <laughs> so there, I mean, like, not only is there no going back, there's no going back. And, and uh, I feel the forces, uh, you know, kind of pushing people. And then there are the leaders we know who are pulled forward by it. Mm-hmm. You know, they're kind of ready in a different and new way. That's really interesting. But the the question of, do we have leaders who would prefer to sit at A? Of course we do. Um, But I don't believe it's a long-term play. No, I I agree. Um, And that does sort of bring me to maybe, maybe this is this uh, question or or your answer to it will sort of explain why some people are saying, um, you know, we should be innovative, but aren't necessarily acting in that way. And some people who are ge- genuinely pushing, you know, uh, pushing strategy forward, you draw a distinction between leaders of innovation mm-hmm. and innovative leaders, which is better and why, how do they differ? Um, how are they different? Yeah. So the first, uh, so, so it's really the difference between the a startup ethos and innovation as it plays out in larger organizations. So, so uh, let me, uh, if I may, I am most interested in how innovation takes place uh, in the places where most people work, which are not startups. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Like a, a startup, that is an innovative leader. He or she has an idea. It's 
built in, baked into their DNA. Yeah. It's uh, singular, singularly focused and away they go. It's, you know, it's a, uh, uh, we can look to emulate some startups in terms of how they work with people. And that's an interesting thing to do. And we can talk about that. Uh, but in a large enterprise, uh, how do you innovate? Mm -hmm. And what you need there is you need um, what we call leaders of innovation, not innovative leaders. So let me um, characterize them. Um, a leader of innovation is someone who understands um, what it takes to innovate in a large company, good, uh, understands systems and structures, and uh, understands innovative thinking, uh, has a good language and grasp of innovation, um, looks at business skills, innovative skills, and influencing skills. If, and it, so it takes this huge surround sound to lead innovation, to be a leader of innovation. An innovative leader is very often the one who comes up with the ideas. Different right. thing. And, and I, I think that that comes back to this idea of strategy being an enabler for change. When you're starting out, the change is from being nothing to being something. Like Peter Thiel okay. says, from zero to one. Right. And, and there's so few people involved. And obviously, that, that person at the center, the leader, of the, the innovative leader, that leader is going to have to be innovative themselves. Whereas... I, I, the way I'm reading what you're saying is that the, in, the leaders of innovation need to create fertile ground within a company to go from A to B and maybe even help define what A to B is rather than coming up with ways to get from A to B. Uh, and, to, and recognize uh, when they have created the fertile ground and they are actually interested in kind of mining their people's, their people and their people's ideas, um, being able to then uh, till that soil, if you will, and move it forward, right? It's a very different skill set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the other thing it is, is it's really uh, very dependent on the degree to which they can um, foundationally describe innovation, like and uh, fundamental, some, they have to do some fundamental work very often. Define innovation versus creativity. Right. Okay. So what is your definition? Ah, um, I'm really tied to this because once too often I have worked with leaders who said, I just need my people to be more creative. Right. And, I, and I think, oh my God, you've got the most creative people on earth. This is not the issue. The issue is we don't have system structures and processes around that creativity that make you, you know, able to realize something. Mm -hmm. So um, um, we would say that um, creativity is uh, the ability to use its imagination to come up with new or unexpected ideas. Okay. It's the use of imagination to bring something into an existence. That thing does not have to, to add value in any kind of way. Right. Let me give you an example. Okay. I have, I come from a very large French Canadian Irish family. Okay. In Quebec. It's very typical in Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have uh, four great aunts who uh, are extraordinarily handy. They can knit anything. They can paint anything. They can do it. They're um, remarkable especially if they have a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other, but <laughs> that aside. So um, they're so incredibly creative. And one of them, my whole life has been giving me crocheted uh, owls. Hmm. Bear with me, Tim. Okay? okay. Okay. Little ones, big ones, red ones, blue ones. It doesn't matter. I have like a, okay. And they are extremely creative and I can't do anything with them. Right. Right. Careful. This is going on air. I, I don't know if your aunt <laughs> listens to the show. <laughs> I'll just I'll just have to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, give that her another drink. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I've tried I've tried putting them on roofs. I've tried putting them in garden, like nothing. So it's just to say you can be highly creative and not uh, innovate at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So innovation is applied creativity that delivers new value. It's, we use a really simple definition. Right. Applied creativity, so you, creativity is the input, innovation is the outcome. 
So, okay. So let, let's talk a little bit about um, how, how a leader can create an organization that is creative or pardon me, innovative. Mm. Um, but let me, let me pick, pick up another quote from you. And that is every organization is designed to get the results it gets. Correct. And this sort of comes back to my concern is you see organizations in stasis, but if they've been in stasis for 40 years, they're probably doing okay. Um, well, they're doing okay. And yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, so, uh, help, help me understand that the point you're trying to raise there is, is, is it that, um, the first step to getting the innovative products or services you want to create, is it, uh, to rethink your organization? Okay. Big question. Uh, and extremely tough to do, right? I mean, <clears throat> we work in culture. You can do cultural assessments. Uh, you can, you can do, you can work in culture till you're blue and it's always uh, considered a multi-year deal. Um, change, like culture, changing culture. Uh, so what interests me is can you change a culture? Yes, you can. And are we in a kind of sweet spot, not right now, but shortly, uh, in terms of changing cultures in organizations that have been big and established for a long time? And the answer is they're more ready than they've ever been because of the demographic change. Right. Right? So you have a whole bunch of people who are very expert at the old way who are now getting ready to retire. And, and, you and you're, a, you're, I believe you're referring to the baby boomers. Uh, they're, they're retiring for the most part. Okay. So you talk about Gen X is the next uh, group to get Gen rid of. <laughs> no, no, no. Gen, Gen X is coming up, then millennials, then Gen Zs. Right. right? And those, uh, that, dem, that's a big demographic. And as that tipping point changes, we have, we are, we have more possibilities than we've ever had before. Does it mean it's going to do it? No. But is it more possible? Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes, right? The answer is yes. Um, so if, um, if for example, you're, uh, you've worked with, you probably have, you've probably worked with millennials. Sure. Right. Um, <clears throat> we have a, uh, an office here and I only hire them. I think they're fantastic, right? I think I, like they're, inter well, as just as a, not that, you can broad stroke any generation, but really uh, intent, they want to know why, they're curious, they're demanding, they're all that. And we just have fantastic ideas as a result. So we have that kind of push coming. There's that. So really helpful. The other thing we have seen, however, is what, remember John Cotter? John Cotter, um, he's the change guru out of uh, Harvard. No. Okay. John Cotter. <laughs> sorry, wrote an article. My God, he's a prof professor em em <clears throat> emeritus at Harvard. Uh, and he wrote uh, uh, an article that has been published probably more than almost any called leading change. Okay. So it's about large scale change. And <clears throat> he has uh, eight steps, you know, which is, you know, make sure you've got the right people. It's, you know, you've got a good vision, you've got a, a sense of urgency, all the things that we know if you want to make change. And indeed, change and innovation, as we know, are deeply tied. <clears throat> but lately, um, I, was in, uh, I was in Boston about three or four years ago, and I was at a <clears throat> symposium where John Cotter was. And he said, what has changed is the viral nature in organizations. In other words, what happens in one department when it works really well, kind of virally moves into others and people learn and they learn and then it, it kind of disintegrates and then they come, come back again. I'm really interested in that <clears throat> because that is something that leaders have great control over. So let me make a distinction between <clears throat> culture and climate. Okay, so yeah. culture, so if you think of a tree, culture are the beliefs, the values built over time, behavior over time. It's like the roots of a tree. Climate is what happens in an organization. Uh, so for example, the characteristics of uh, a team or, an, or, or a unit <clears throat> that has characteristics that support innovation. And so that is things like, <clears throat> excuse me, people feeling challenged, right. um, playfulness, uh, idea support, idea time, freedom, 
autonomy, those things. And over those things, leaders have great control. So you can change a climate. And if we do enough of this work, we can, we can kind of get a viral thing going in the organization. So that, that's very interesting because when I think of, uh, when you say viral, I think of the mechanisms that ideas might uh, flow through an organization. Right. And one way is from, from external. I mean, we're all, you know, we, we can see things in magazines or on TV or on, the, on YouTube or whatever. There's all kinds of ways to know what's going on in other organizations. And so we can bring the ideas that we see from other organizations. Sometimes I think it's easier to do that than it is to bring ideas from within the organization. And that, yeah. is, a, that is a leadership role. Mm. You could say, look, it's welcome to tell other people what went wrong or what experiments you tried, maybe mm. even have a mechanism to share that information. Have you seen that succeed in organizations where they're able to create a, a forum or a, a how do they how do they encourage the virality of ideas within the organization? Okay, so um, the idea. Uh, so first of all, there's ideas going viral, as you're describing it, and that happens best uh, when uh, you're rewarded for doing it. Mm-hmm. Everything is measures and right. Everything is metrics, really. You know, almost or incentives. I mean, why would I do something I'm getting rocked on the knuckles for? Yeah. Right. Um, so it's so, so first of all, uh, creating a climate where risk is uh, considered a piece of it, where you can risk um, without fear. Uh, so that's going to be iteration. We know that it's going to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then then it's going to build, you know, that that kind of thing. Uh, but when we're looking for so for that viral piece. Uh, the most important thing is to, uh, first of all, have a leader who is willing to look outside and, and has, a, has supported that kind of feel in their team. And um, secondly, is really good at uh, having small wins in short order. So here's one of, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So for example, if you remember the, um, there was an article, uh, there was a survey in McKinsey, I think it was 2017, 2018. Uh, where uh, it said something like uh, 90% of um, leaders say innovation is important and uh, their satisfaction is something like, uh, you know, right? It's just, it's, there's a huge gap between- One's, how- one's like 80% and the other one's 20%. The satisfaction 20%. with it is like 20%, yeah. Now I'm going to make an argument about that. Uh, and I think part of the reason- um, that people are so dis that that especially the people McKinsey interviews are so um, upset like who have that big discrepancy is if you're in an established company who's been really successful for a really long period of time and you turn your head and the guy in the garage down the street comes up in two weeks with the best idea for custom that you've ever seen you go we're terrible mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is awful right because. Sure. He's unencumbered <laughs> by history or 60,000 employees or anything else that he has. Um, and so people will say they're deeply dissatisfied with it. Right. Uh, and they're dissatisfied indeed, um, too, because what they're looking for is they're looking for disruptive, but they can't manage it. They're or or can't even endorse it sometimes. No, uh, because it threatens what they already have. Yeah. Right. So for me, where it gets interesting is if, uh, and one of the things we do is when we work with companies, we say, okay, can we just like, we'll define innovation. Great. And now let's talk about levels of innovation because people tend, it's a plastic word. Innovation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What does that mean? And people think like, if I say to you, for example, uh, what are the most innovative organizations, you know, what would you say? Who would come to mind? Just oh, personally, I mean, Elon Musk's companies astonish right. me. Sp- SpaceX, uh, Tesla, astonishing, right? Yeah. But, so we think, we think Tesla. Um, which other organizations do you think of? Uh, I just uh, heard about Booking.com and how they um, do A/B testing on almost everything they all do. The, everything, yeah. everything, all the time. And that is, and that is one definition of innovation: is the ability is. to say we're going to break things down and test. It's a fantastic capability. Um, so what you've captured is both ends of the spectrum. Because when you say to people, um, an innovative company, nine times out of 10, they talk about uh, Tesla, 
they talk about Google, they talk about Amazon, right? I mean, Apple. Uber, Airbnb, right? Yep. Like, I mean, it's just, there's this handful that changed the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what people remember when they think about innovation. Meanwhile, if you think about, you just talked about booking, uh, booking.com, or you think about Apple, uh, Apple are not a disruptor. They make, you know, they make their living through incremental innovation, through evolutionary, like a, just like every friend I have, you know, changes their phone every two years, right? I mean, it's, and this changes or that changes. So it's not to say they can't and not to say they won't, but so far. So for me, what this means is that innovation takes place along a continuum, mm -hmm. from incremental through to disruptive. And it's really about marshalling your people, your effort, and your resource accordingly. And if you dig into the research, most large organizations, 80% um, of the innovation they do is in the incremental space. Sure. You know, improved processes, products, services, you know, internal, those pieces. They've got maybe 15% um, in the radical. They're doing about 50, you know, they're, they're trying things out and they've got about 2% of their, of their resource for, for disruptive. And very often that's an innovation lab. So people do very poorly there. Like they have, everyone has them, but they, it's hard to translate them back to the organization. Right. Right. Unless of course you start a standalone business. Right. A skunk uh, works. A skunk where you do that. Right. Yeah. But but what happens if you think about it, when you have an innovation lab and everyone has them, I work with so many banks of innovation labs, is the translation from the innovation lab back into the bank is really tough. Yeah. Because I wasn't a part of that. I'm a, an AVP or I'm a VP of a, and you've got an idea and I don't know how, you, you, you know that you've had the discussion, you know what it, what it sounds like. So, <clears throat> so most of the innovation that takes place in organizations is incremental. And this is not a bad thing. Now, you cannot incremental your way into disruption, <laughs> right? I can't make small changes and in the end, be in a new market or new space. But what it does do, Tim, is it engages your workforce. We talked before about climate, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're interested in, if you begin by thinking about incremental innovation, anyone, anywhere can be involved in that. Right. Like, I'll, right. I can walk down the hall of any company, stop someone and say, can you think of a uh, three ways that we could take care of each other better and stand back? <laughs> right. Of course. Or, yes. yeah, or clients. We all have ideas and we all have very good ideas, but we don't have internal mechanisms to support them. So you begin by honoring incremental. That way you get oxygen in your organization. And in doing that, you are going to find people who really start, who like working, they like working bigger. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader of innovation, I have to be paying attention. Right. So let me see if, if we're on the same page, because there's an example that crossed my mind and that is the Chrysler minivan. So when the yeah. minivan first came out, that was a true innovation. I mean, sure, there were unibody vehicles in Europe that were serving the same function, mm -hmm. but it was a sensation in North America, this idea that you could have a car-like van. But then I remember, and I, I couldn't possibly tell you the name of the executive, but at some point 30 years later, an executive was interviewed about how, is this really an all-new minivan? And, and he said, well, look, we've changed the, if you take an ax and you change the head and then you change the handle, is it still the same ax? Because they've been doing incremental improvements to this van for 30 years. Of course, it's much better than it used to be. Don't worry about whether it's all new, but how, how do you create the, so you've talked a little bit about how these incremental changes create the, the capacity and the, the awareness and the confidence to to embrace a large change, but how do you initiate that in a company as, as a leader, when you say, okay, look, all our product lines, we've, we've incrementally improved them as far as we can. Right. We need to do something different. I'm really, um, I'm really interested in this question because then what happens is it starts becoming a systems and structures question. It's not a people question anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you have to keep your eye on people. You have to be aware of who thinks differently. But for example, 
if you, to build on your point, if you think about incremental innovation to start, um, and then you look at the next, which is radical. So, you know, kind of a uh, slightly new market, not entirely new, that kind of thing. Hi, uh, a hybrid car is a radical, right? It's got an sure. electric, you don't use that. Okay, great. Um, but if you think about that, what happens is if you're in incremental, you are working very often uh, in this space, departmentally, maybe a business unit, you know, like this, you're making your, your improvements. When you move to radical, you're moving, you're starting to move across the organization. I love it. Yes. Right. So here's what happens. So if you think about that, um, what becomes incredibly important is what uh, David Weiss talks about as the white space, which is the space in between departments, functions, and units, and nobody owns it. Right. And that's where that's where great ideas go to die mm-hmm. because uh, the idea comes out of sales, but now there's marketing. It wasn't marketing's idea. There's no way to do it. And it, right, operationally in process, um, when, once you start moving bigger in an, uh, in an organization, you're, you're, you're talking about uh, holistically and impact. Did you watch the Olympics this year? Did you not, watch them? Not chance? really. No, not really. No. Okay. Uh, there's one, uh, there's one uh, part of the Olympics that always, Summer Olympics, that has always interested me, and it's the relay race. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, this year, uh, in the Ameri- on the American team, four of the fastest men on earth were on that team. Mm-hmm. Fastest men in the world, okay, mm-hmm. on the relay team. Yeah. And they didn't qualify. Fascinating. Okay. Right? And they didn't qualify. Because, because the teamwork do, wasn't there. The handoffs no, were. Hand yeah. They couldn't do a handoff. They were all really. Interesting. It's so interesting. And it happens in organizations all the time. Hmm. You know, we don't train people on the handoff, but let me just say this. And I want to come back to something you mentioned, which is it's metrics and measures, Mm -hmm. right? So if I am only measured, rewarded against what I do here, but we're looking for a larger innovative offer, uh, I'm not going to be available to to do good hands. I'm not going to be available to do that. So that lately I've been thinking about this. And I, I saw a small video by Patrick uh, Lencioni. Do you know Patrick? No. Right? Five dis, uh, the, the five dysfunctions of team. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> he does a lot of teamwork. But one of the things he says, he has a, just, it's a short video. It's just a couple of minutes long. He's working with a senior team. And what he says is uh, the most, imp- so he's got C-suites for every function, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You, you know what the table looks like. Uh, and what he, what he says is, you have to understand, your number one team should be this table. Right. Okay. Not your uh, own people. Not your own people. Right. And they flip out. They go, no, I've got to take care of my people. And mm-hmm. he says, you will take care of your people by taking care of this team. That is a discussion, Tim, around innovation. Right. Because the kind of initiatives you need take place, what well, might start here, but they're going to die here. So that that's a fascinating viewpoint because it's, it's revealing that incremental innovation can work well when there's stable interfaces with other groups. Yes. But when you want to make a, a whole new vehicle or a whole new program or a whole new service, you need to go across all these different silos. You basically can't afford to have silos. You can't. And so that that's the huge challenge then. The 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 organizational when you're when you're planning your organization, organization is about compartmentalization. It's about creating stable interfaces through groups so they can work to get their jobs done. As long as you're building on an industrial model. Right? I mean, it's an old, old model. So what's the model now? I'm much more organic. Okay. Right. Uh, but it takes great courage to change those things up. So yeah. if you, um, a holacracy, uh, Gary Hamel's book, a holacracy talks about new ways of organizing. 
And so he's out on, he's here on the edge, but really if we are going to survive, we can't be, you know, the, uh, the iron tanker (laughs) in in the ocean. We just can't do it anymore. We'll do it for a while longer, but yeah. Well, I, I I mean, you can, but your competition is going to be a speedboat and a million trouble. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So, um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the possibility of making incremental changes in small groups where mm. you, you already have connections with everybody. And then this idea of doing it across the organization, that, that's, a, that's a, a horizontal discussion. Let's talk about up and down. Okay. What, uh, I, I get the impression that you see an importance to the flow of ideas coming from uh, the, the bottom, if you want to, I mean, you know, people get, yeah, yeah, that, people bristle against the idea of a top and a bottom, but you know, the table of, of, of organize the org, the org chart has somebody at the top and then a whole bunch right. of people below. Um, how do you, how do you play with the idea of ideas coming up or down versus incremental versus disruptive ideas? Okay. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, um, if you think about, um, uh, incremental ideas, just to go back to one of the original points, anyone can, anyone can come up with that idea. Um, disruptive ideas require a, a, a diversity of thought. Mm. You know what I mean? It, it, it requires a, a far reaching kind of uh, foresight in, uh, intelligence and those pieces, it's a different audience. However, let me say this, uh, the, Organizations I know who, who so let's look at a, an organization like Corning. Mm-hmm. Okay, Gorilla Glass. Right. Um, but if you're me, I grew up with Corning. Oh, as, I have Corning plates. Uh, you play, they right? last 20 years. They're excellent. <laughs> <laughs> they, have 20, you know, they, have, they have 20 years. They're white with little blue flowers on them. Do you remember? Sure. Oh, yep. my God. I have the Corning. plain ones. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you still have them. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Um, so the uh, so there's Corning, for example, and uh, they have evolved into an eleven billion dollar company. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things they say is we have um, a process uh, that everyone in the organization understands. Our innovation pro- we have a common language and a process that everyone understands. And if you're, one of the questions is how do you move? Like, so first of all, unless you have a process, I don't know how you access people's creativity. That's what the purpose of the process is to do. So um, so at Corning, uh, the receptionists know the process and they know what to do if they have an idea. Like it's all visible and transparent and they are a big company. They're an enterprise and they make um, every dollar they make is out of an innovation uh, 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 point of view, an innovation lens. They work. That's what they do. Uh, So they, so if you think about it, uh, what, what, what do organizations need to do if they want to get adaptable and, you know, be prepared for the future. Well, first of all, they have to define what it is, what innovation is. I hate to do this. I'll beat it to death, but they do because people just don't understand what they, they always think it's technology. Can we mm-hmm. give this to IT? Oh my God, stop it. Stop it. The, uh, <laughs> it's not that IT isn't great. It's that IT shouldn't be leading your innovation efforts. For goodness sakes, IT is an enabler, a fantastic enabler, but an enabler anyway. Yeah. So, um, so that I've been said, but what you need, uh, at least I think you do, is, uh, is a process that's commonly understood. And so if you do that, so first of all, you have a process, you have good definition, you have a process, people understand levels of innovation, they understand what people need at what time. They also understand that there's different types of innovation, right? So there's process innovation, product innovation, service organizational innovation. I work a lot with government policy and social innovation. I mean, there's channel innovation. There's So anyone can work in any area, but they have a really solid foundation in definitions and they know how to get things done because they have a proven process. And are they public about what that process is or is that oh, a yeah. sauce? So nope. do you know a little nope. bit about it? Can you share how that sure. process works inside uh, the company? A- 
it's a five step process, which moves from um, ideation to um, feasibility, to testing, to implementation. And the way they look at it is risk is high in the beginning and it, it comes down and then it, you know, goes up and collaboration comes up. Um, so, and they use, and they work across functions. So that process, which is four or five steps is like marketing operations, uh, manufacturing, etc. And so everyone's involved all the time. It's fantastic. And they're manufacturing. I mean, it's not a, it's not a startup business at all. Do you know what I mean? They've been around mm-hmm. for hundred years. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. Long enough for me to have plates from them. So they've been around a long time. <laughs> um, so, but the way you described it just now, yeah. Um, it sounds like it's, it sounded to me like it was going through a bunch of review and gating processes. Uh, so it sounds like a linear process where, where the, the way the way they're dealing with silos is to pass from one silo to the other. So they go through kind of like this. Okay. Right. They go through like this. Um, so there are uh, it's a manufacturing business. So there are different um, very determined structures. Right. Okay. Uh, however, um, I'm trying to think uh, uh, there are other organizations uh, uh, that, that when they, when they have a process, it's more of a framework. Mm-hmm. So there's more flexibility attached to it. Right. So you might, um, you might, uh, instead of always coming up with an idea, moving to, you know, uh, so understanding some challenge, moving to an idea, testing it, iterating it, coming back, they can move in and out of it in okay. a, way that's more organic. But nonetheless, uh, there's there's really clear discipline around each of them, of each of those phases. Uh, the, the play that's interesting is that uh, everyone feels like they can play. Right. Everybody has a role. That is delightful, right? Delightful. If you want people to be excited about coming to work, engaging them in, in the core changes, that's that's really important. It but is in the other. Here's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. The, so, the only other so thing. <laughs> one of the one of one. See, we're excited. Um, <laughs> one of the one of the great phrases I've heard, and I don't know who it's by because I've done my research, but I it's somebody quoting somebody else. They don't say who it is, but the quote <laughs> is that yes. innovation is a denial of service attack on existing products. <laughs> and and the the spirit there is that if you if you are rent, like let's say you work at Chrysler and you've got a lineup of cars and you've got vans that are selling well and somebody mm-hmm. says hey let's start a brand new product it's called a minivan and yeah. it does everything your van does but it uses less gas and it's easier to drive whoa hold the phone like you you right. first of all we don't know if anybody is going to buy it because it looks like a toy and secondly I'm I would like to update my own vans. So how, how do you, even when innovation is valuable, there's a, there is, there are legitimate reasons to push back on it. And how do you, how do you calibrate that? It's um, I once watched uh, uh, an interview with John Deneen. I think he's actually passed now, mm. uh, but he was, um, he was president of GE's electric transport uh, transportation arm. I didn't even know they had one. <laughs> uh, and uh and I was, uh, because I was really interested in the interview and I was thinking about it just the other day, um, I looked them up and they have launched some of their first electric trains and mm-hmm. it, 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 it's turned out to be highly successful. Anyway, one of the things he was saying was he had two uh, really fantastic heads of, he, he, he had a head of business who had a PL, who had a budget, who had that, and he had a guy who he had given a kind of innovation portfolio to. And this guy uh, made a presentation around electric vehicles and the operation guy went bananas, mm-hmm. right? It was going to draw a resource. Uh, it was going to take time. It was his p not that guy's. Like, you've got to be kidding. And uh, the president said, uh, turned to him and said, the reason you are successful right now is because your predecessor, okay, 
took a gamble and you're going to have to eat it. So, so, but that comes right from the top. Right. Okay. Right. And and that is critical. Absolutely. Setting the priorities. I think this is, this is a, a huge component of strategy is deciding what to do. And, and I don't mean how, I don't mean the details, but even just like what product lines we're going to consider, right? That's a, that's a huge piece of work for the strategist. It is. And, it, and if it's going to uh, embody, if it's going to be around innovation, it's got to be your, your, your C-suite. It's, it's, a, it's a serious, it's a very serious discussion. It's like, do you remember when um, Philips, uh, who were, a light bulb man. They're like the GE of Europe. Of Europe yeah. uh, went into LED. Do you remember that? Like I don't they, remember they, the moment, no, but I mean, okay. that's part of what all these lighting companies are doing. Right, but they did it 10 years ago. They did it well ahead mm. of, the, of the curve. Oh, I see. I can see okay. the tension there, but we're supposed to be selling real bulbs it's right this. now. <laughs> and what's this, right? Yeah. And they, um, so what they did was they made their bets because uh, they saw the future in a really big way and they cannibalized their own business. And other, they, they just, they did it. Um, he had a, um, a, a, a innovation ambitious uh, ambition matrix, like a portfolio of core radical and transformation uh, all set up. It was shared by everyone and all of it was LED. So that's a fantastic story. And I, it reminds me of something I saw recently, and that is... Uh, Again, I won't remember the, the, the man's name, but the CEO of BMW hmm. was recently quoted. He was asked at some sort of shareholder meeting or something. He was asked, you know, what, what are your plans around electric? We see all these jurisdictions around the world saying we're going to ban internal combustion vehicles. What's your plan? And he said, well, you know, uh, if, if jurisdictions uh, um, ban internal combustion vehicles, we will have a full lineup of electric vehicles but we don't think it's a very good idea. Now <laughs> that contrasts with what Phillips did, right? They, they saw the writing on the wall and they said, this is the way we're going to go. We can, we can survive the expense and the loss of revenue with the expectation of higher revenues in the future. And we can, we can be on, on the side of the angels when it comes to the environment. Um, and we can beat the competition. You know, the Wait. competition is going to go that way in 10 years anyway. Right. And furthermore, the people who are coming up with the best bulbs, where are they going to work? Somewhere that's grudgingly saying, exactly. you can't win a race you don't think is worth running. And, and so you what you described you Phillips doing is very brave. That's not what Kodak did. That's not what Blockbuster did, right? No, it's not. It is. Um, and it's not what GM did. Do you remember um, the, what was his name? Oh, my God. Um Oh, anyway, he was, uh, he was, uh, he wasn't the CEO, but he was in a, a serious senior position. Uh, this is about uh, 10 years ago. And he, he said, we're a car manufacturer and uh, climate change is a crock of poo. Yep. Okay. Do you remember that quote? I, and so- I, well, I know exactly who you're talking about. I can see his face. Yeah. Gray um, hair. Uh, I don't remember. He looked like, he looked like a CEO from central casting. He kind of looked like DeLorean. <laughs> right. Did. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> I'll, I'll right. put it in the show notes, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but just that idea, you know, climate change is a, a crock of poo. And uh, therefore, GM has been so behind the, the, the starting line. Yeah. Do you know, like it's, yeah, not at all forward thinking that way. So let's switch gear a little bit and talk about um, <clears throat> how we connect innovation to our users, the idea of user centered, uh-huh. which is, I, I, I've only really encountered that as a theme um, maybe in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've all, I think everybody's been sort of subconsciously aware that you have to make things for users in the end. But the, the focus on the user is a, is a new thing. Do you want to get into what the value is there? Uh, yeah, here's what I'd like you to imagine. Um, Christmas is coming up. Mm-hmm. Just bear with me, Tim. <laughs> and uh, someone gives you a gift 
But I want to um, unwrap it now, Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're like, oh, my husband can't wait for anything either. So uh, you and it's an electronic. It's a little like electronic piece. that's about this big. OK, okay. Sure it. and it is in a plastic container that is this thick <laughs> and is this big. OK, sure. and is this right. And this is so no one will steal it. Right. Okay. Now, here's the trick. No one can open it. Do you right. remember the Seinfeld episode where he takes knives out of his out of his drawer? And <laughs> he's like trying to open up the thing. That's me. Anytime someone gets and sure. I am infuriated. Oh, by the it. classic is when the scissors are in the package. You can only open with scissors <laughs> <laughs> that you can only open with scissors. OK, so um, so this I this uh, there's been. I think that there, there has been um, uh, we we talk about user centered design, but what's beginning to uh, like what's and it's been we've talked about it for quite some time. Uh, but what's ha happening now is people are demanding it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Like um, I uh, I no longer want to look at a USB and not know how to put it in. <laughs> right. I am, like I can't believe I've been doing that for thirty years. Do you know sure. what I mean? And yeah. it kicks me off. And the first person who designs one I want, I'm 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 done. Right. So uh, we we talk about it. Most organizations um, innovate for themselves, not for their customer. Internal processes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. internal services. Uh, the service that you deliver externally hasn't been innovated in a million years. Right. You've done Six Sigma on every process you have internally, but that isn't offering you new value. It's not innovation. It's just more efficient. Right. Right. So design thinking. So we um, we work in this field uh, a lot uh, and it's getting um, and the biggest challenge is not in product innovation in truth, uh, because uh, products are built to be touched. Do you know, like right. they're built every once in a while you hit some anomaly like the plastic packaging, but for the most part, uh, however, uh, services like don't you want uh, the telecom services, you know, to keep their user in? Wouldn't that just be fantastic? Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, like every time I, I'm on the phone, I'm not going to use any names, but anytime I'm on the phone to a telecom, I'm like, have you ever sat at the other end of this? Yeah. Who is doing your designing? Yeah, uh, absolutely. This whole, yeah. this whole piece around design. And I think we're going to see very interesting design uh, as people move to hybrid. Hybrid meaning? Hybrid work. Oh, okay. So let's dig into that a little bit because okay. am I right in thinking that, it, that the reason it will change is partly because we're all eating our own Alpo. Like we are all, all the way, the way we interact with customers is often online and now we're interacting with each other online. And so that might be, that might create more empathy. Is that where you're going with that? With uh, the, the, well, what I think is, um, the use that organizations that do well in the upcoming, um, I think uh, when I talk about hybrid, I'm talking about people being here and then people having to go in physically, right? There was an article mm -hmm. just this morning on the importance of, of a touch culture and, you know, rubbing up against culture. Um, but the organization that is able to, to use your word, really develop empathy for their employees in a deep way. That is not just say, what do you want? Because I'm here to tell you, it's just like the minivan. Nobody knew they wanted it until right. they got it, mm -hmm. right? It's the unmet need. Beautiful. So organizations right now are just working on the top of this. They're, in other words, they're asking their employees, what do you want? And people are doing their best to say, how about some childcare? Do you know, like they're, they're, they have immediate needs and they're kind of describing those. Uh, the companies or organizations that do well are really going to be digging deep into what is really essential. So this is, this is really interesting to me because I am in the camp that would be quite happy working from home an awful lot of the time. And what you just said made me, made me realize that maybe instead of 
because uh, there's been a big upswing in terms of uh, how to effectively manage uh, online, how to effectively collaborate online. I think we need to have courses on how to collaborate in person because especially with the concerns we all have, a lot of us are just stuck in our office anyway. Like what's even the point of being in the same building? You're on a, the, the echo from somebody else's Zoom is, is actually distracting me. Um, and so maybe there needs to be more sort of user-centered thought on what, what it is we're going into the building for. Like being, Completely I right. think that there, I, I, I'm sort of babbling a bit, but the thing is that there's this, this assumption that there's value to being in the same hallway or in the same room. Mm -hmm. And that's probably true, but it's unconscious. And if we're much more deliberate about it, we might get more value out of it. And we might be able to do it in one day a week as opposed to five. I think that, that um, that's entirely true. Uh, there's, um, I was reading some research recently that said, people say creativity happens when people get together. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're having trouble actually proving that that's true. Sure. Well, because we've been creative for 18 months. You know, we've been, we've been, there was uh, some colleagues of, of our, of um, ours did uh, just, I'll send you the article. It's called um, <clears throat> five ways to sustain the creativity that was unleashed during the, the pandemic. Right. And the research is that people just did amazing things during yeah. COVID because they had to. But it, yeah, exactly. It wasn't because we were home. It was no. because we had this sudden galvanizing goal of everybody rethink the process. Like, you know, yeah. I work somewhere where you're not allowed to work from home, or at least you weren't right up until the day we all had to work from I home. Know. Right. I and we weren't, know. and we weren't providing our business online. And then we had to provide a hundred percent of our business online. Yes, so it was a, it was a very challenging time where I, that challenge brought out the best in people. Like it, you know, it's all, I mean, I don't want to overdo this because it's nothing like it, but when people, you know, fight the same fire, there's a camaraderie mm -hmm. that comes from that. You know, they, there was never any doubt that everybody had a purpose, right. that, that you were part of a team, that you're doing something important. And that, that sensation I think is at risk as we all come back, as we're all sort of marching back because we have to, and, and, and we're doing a little bit of both. Yeah, I'm uh, really interested in what you're saying. Uh, and the reason I'm thinking about it is there's really, if you think about it, there's two ways to galvanize people. One is fire. Mm -hmm. Fire at my back, I am galvanized, man. I'm, I'm all over it. And the <laughs> other uh, is light. Sure. Right? Something to aspire so to. It's, it's this. Yeah. Uh, and where we are is we've had, like, see if this is close to your experience. Maybe, maybe not. But there was the fire and we got really creative about a million things. Um, and it's been going on for a year and a half, a little longer. Uh, and that uh, threat is less in mm -hmm. a way. And we are exhausted in another. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, so this at, at some point, this ceases to work. Your adrenal glands are done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't do it anymore. It's, yeah, we're well over. Said. it's true. Uh, and so now uh, some people will still like to work. Uh, you know, I'm not too sure how it'll play out. Um, but what I do know is that the employers or the people who pay a lot of attention, listen intently. Uh, and acutely to what's being said are going to get to a place that will attract people. So I don't think it's ever going to be one thing or the other. In other words, I don't, I, I think that there's work, you know, like it'll be a combo of something. Um, but, and I'm very interested to see what happens. Uh, but I think uh, there are some organizations that are going to do really well and some who are just coined to cut and paste. Well, and the thing is that, there could be an emergence of firms that are entirely virtual completely that you wind up competing with. So, so it's not just that the companies that existed before have this choice of whether to return to what they were before or embrace some sort of hybrid or even be fully online. It's also that you've got people who have discovered that they don't have to just collaborate with people within geographic convenience. Right. right. 
Right. That's huge because we've already got a star system happening in the world where you can see that the, the, the wealth gap is partly due. I mean, partly it's because wealth begets wealth, but also because the, the super capable people, they collaborate together. And, and, and this is going, I think this is going to accelerate that trend because now if you're, instead of being two guys in a garage, like Hewlett Packard, you can be two guys and three gals in different garages around the world. Right. Completely right. Um, I, uh, uh, there's this deep understanding of being location agno- agnostic, right? Yeah. Like I can hire from anywhere. And what does that look like? Right. It's yeah, a, huge changes. It's a huge change. I worked, um, I had someone come and speak at the, at, uh, in my, in our program um, last year. And this is really interesting. So um, it's a company called Ultranauts. I don't know if you've heard of no, them. No, I never heard of that. Okay. Ultranauts are out of New York City. Uh, and what they do is they do uh, quality control on engineering technology, that kind of thing. Uh, so the um, Rajesh, who Anandan, who is an owner, who a founder out of MIT uh, and a partner, uh, established this company and they did a couple of things. First of all, they uh, only hired people, uh, not only, 70% of the people they hired are on the autistic spectrum. Mm good. Uh, and two, they decided to do it remotely. They have never had a physical office. Right. Okay. So I was very interested in talking to him uh, because I wanted to understand how you manage, like they're, they're, they, to speak to your point about remote and competition, they are entirely remote and mm-hmm. they're beating IBM and Cap Gemini like crazy. Okay. And they have a very engaged workforce. So I said to him, I, I have to, I, I, I would like to understand how that happens when you're, when you're dealing remotely and they're all over the world and um, they are in such touch with their people. It is amazing. People call, they write, they email, they survey. They're always asking. It's a very, and then uh, he gave this example and he said, um, so we got some feedback. We got uh, some information that people wanted um, better feedback. And so we thought, oh, okay, uh, we'll, uh, cr- we'll craft a workshop. So that's what he did. Uh, so they, they crafted this workshop. Everyone went on the workshop uh, to take this uh, course in uh, giving feedback, receiving feedback, and the dial didn't change at all. Nothing changed. Mm. And so then they're very smart in this company. So then he kicked back and went, okay, we've asked the wrong questions. Let's, we've got to find out more. This is why I say we have to dig deep. Right. So they started talking to their staff and uh, to people. And uh, what they realized is that when one person said, I want more feedback, he meant, I want feedback in the morning. And, <laughs> there, and, and someone else might've meant, I want it at night. And someone right. wanted it in person, uh, in by phone and some wanted it by text. Okay. And so there was a whole bunch of kind of criteria. So they have created something called a biodex, which is a leader's user manual. Like it's fantastic. Right. Right. And so feedback and you, so you look at it and he, and this person wants it, this, 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 and this, and you adjust accordingly. Great. Uh, how do you want to learn this, 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 like, it's a sure. beautiful thing. Have you seen the footage of, I think this has become a common thing now, but I think it was a kindergarten teacher or a grade one teacher. And she had these three pictures on the wall and one was a hug. One was a fist bump. And the other was good morning, just a bow and a good morning or something like that. And the kids walk up and they go that one. And the kid gets a hug. And then the kid goes that one and he gets a fist bump. And no, so it's a way, it. it's a way of greeting the kids as they I come in so. exactly the way they choose. And it doesn't have to be, it's not sewn onto their shirt, right? It can be however they feel that morning. I think that's so I thought that was beautiful. And it, and it just goes to show that we all, we all have our own ways of it's preferring true. to be engaged with. So, right. Uh, what I, I, I love that. And I love the idea of an organization uh, understanding its power. Like right. that's very powerful. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned the word, you know, engagement before, right? And this is a big deal for organizations, as we know right now. Yeah. Uh, they want it. The big resignation. The big, like, can I ask you something? If people resign, where are they going to work? 
Well, and that is the fly in the ointment, isn't it? But I think part of it is there's been so much COVID related stimulus to the, in, to the economy right. that it's creating, it, it, it's making pe- the signals are not reliable. That might be the case. And That's I think it's point easy point. to say you're going to look for work. What you're really saying is you're not happy. That's what you're saying. And I, I think that um, a lot of people are not happy there. It comes back to this idea that, well, well, two things. One is being, being uh, a, a person who helps other people in person is a, has been a really tough job for the last 18 months. Mm-hmm. And those people would very much like to move on. Right. I can see that, you know, mm-hmm. it's just awkward. You don't have the same social cues. You got to keep it's your tough. distances. It's tough. Yeah. And also you have this constant specter of the possibility of you getting COVID. Right. So that's tough. Um, but then there's also the other people who have been fortunate enough to work from home safely. Now they're going to have to come back to work. You know, I think that there's a lot of people who are, are who have discovered the, the freedom of the flexibility of how they deal with their time and, and their attention during the day. Um, it's a signal that they, they don't want to return to normal. But I think you're right. I don't think 80% of whatever percentage it is, I don't think they can all quit all of a sudden. They're not all going to quit. They're not all going to quit. Because the way it's phrased is, are you going to look for a new job? Here you go. Um, We began, part of what we began talking about just a little while ago was um, keeping the user at the center of our thinking, right? Mm -hmm. As we develop that, which is new. Uh, This is what organizations have to do with their employees. Sure. You know, they have to do design, they have to have user focused um, initiatives around people's experience. Uh, Because we know, first of all, there's going to come, you want to keep your good people. Yeah, absolutely. And those are the ones that do have options. If there's going to be even 10% churn, who's it going to be? They're the ones who are going. Yeah. Right. So we really, uh, so there's, I, I love leaders to be thinking of design thinking, not in terms of products. It's enough already, right? You know, like <laughs> uh, something like uh, 90% of the, uh, of the effort in innovation is in products and it delivers about 10% of the value. Most of the value comes from business model innovation, process innovation, service innovation. And we don't talk about that enough. Uh, so, organizational innovation. Mm -hmm. So the more leaders can think about, it's hard because leaders have been through a tough time too. Well, that's true. Right. That is true. Yeah. It's not like they're fresh and ready to go, you know? So we, so having systems or processes would be really helpful for them. So they're not having to make it up out of their, you know, like I'd love to do design thinking work, user-centered work with organizations around employees to see what what next looks like. Yeah, that would be great work. Well, I think it would be really um, helpful to to design think your way through what it is you hope to accomplish with everybody getting back together again. I, I'm going to return to that because I think that yes. part of the exhaustion is just being that that person who's insisting all the time that people come back and they don't even know why they're they're like, I've been working really well for 18 months. Thank you very much. And so if there was a way to articulate that and gather that, I think that would be really good. I want to pick up on design thinking a little bit and talk to you about what my impressions are as Mm. it compares to lean, lean startup. Okay. Right. So my, my worldview is that you need, you need desirability. You need uh, feasibility, which means, yeah. so first of all, does somebody want it? Can we make it? And then there's viability. Can we sell it basically? That's it. And I think of design thinking as being an instrument for detecting desirability, sometimes latent desire, something that's an unmet need, as you've said earlier. Um, feasibility is a tricky one, but, but agile is a good tool in that space. And then, and then lean startup is good for viability. Viability. And, when you go from desirability to viability, you're going from kind of like a focus group or people you get in touch with to see like the user group to see, would you like this? Mm. Then you're going to a customer. You're going, you're, you're going to your customers with lean startup. Basically the metric is, are people buying? Mm. And 
the the once you what I sort of sometimes I think of design thinking as the starter motor. And once you're selling your product, once the once you've got your first minivan, now all you're doing is improving the minivan. And that is a that is contact with the customer, generally speaking, is what do you want? Do you want a place to hang your purse? Do you want a hideaway seat? Yeah. Do you want a dog leash? This is something you get from the from the buying community. Mm-hmm. And so I, I almost come to the point where I discount design thinking, but I think that where design thinking is really critical is inside the organization. So the people who don't often have a choice when you give them a system or a process or a service, you work here. This is the system we use. Mm -hmm. Get used to it. And sometimes they ask them up front, so what do you want? Okay. And then they spend three years creating it and they come back and go, well, we promised to make it and you promised to like it. And that's what design thinking uh, short circuits is that constant <laughs> feedback. Am I am I onto something with the idea that design thing is more relevant inside than ever? I don't know that it's. Um, I'm not too sure about that. Uh, what I am sure about is it's entirely re- relevant internally, and it's also real. You know, I happen to believe it's also relevant externally. Externally, yeah. Um, but um, uh, but internally, it it's like. Uh, the the uh, the thing that I'm aware of is there are some untapped areas, uh, and design thinking for products is not untapped. It's uh, it's people are deeply embedded in understanding how people use products, right. what they do, what they you know uh, unmet needs, latent needs, whatever it is. Uh, but internally, you're right. That is very rarely the approach. And then what happens to speak to your point? is um, as they do, like, I cannot deliver another pilot, okay? I can't, I can't. Right. Uh, it takes, like, it takes three years to deliver the pilot. And all that has happened is the moment that pilot begins, it's on somebody's dashboard. It is no longer live. In other words, um, in design thinking, what you want is small iterations, which you're familiar with from, you know, other methodologies. You want small inter- iterations. So, but internally, we don't do that. <laughs> internally, what we do is we deliver pilots. Right. 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 They're big behemoth suckers with 10 people at the back taking notes all the time. It's it's like a waterfall process right. as opposed to an iter- iteration process. So, um, di- design thinking was made for us in this environment. Okay. And, and so that's it. Times. So that's an interesting distinction um, that a pilot, because we often, the way a pilot is presented, like a pilot episode for a TV show, it's an experiment, but it's also an entire one hour movie that you are a 40 minute movie that you created, right. you casted, you did. That's a big piece of work as opposed to doing smaller incremental things on the way to find out if even it would succeed. That's right. Yeah. Um, okay. Like I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if that's not, not what we're seeing in streaming T in streaming services. Do you know, like uh, where before you would have a, in, in regular TV, you'd have a pilot. They then they do 13 episodes and now we're seeing limited series. Now we're seeing a whole different approach to things. Right. And it has to do with this testing uh, test and iterate and learn. Do you know, like I was, uh, the thing that most struck me in the World Economic Forum's job study, uh, the one uh, that, that out to 2022, um, is that the second skill that they see mm. as most important is the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. It's called active learning strategies to learn unlearn and relearn. And uh, I think this is one of the most profound skills, period. And if we could, if we could help organizations do this, learn, unlearn, relearn with, with that kind of agility without talking about agile, do you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, Like small a agile. Absolutely. Well, Uh, let me explore that with you because it reminds me of Daniel Kahneman's work on Mm -hmm. thinking fast and slow. Yes. Right. This idea that when you think fast, you're really applying a rule that you've you've internalized somehow. And it's a way to act quickly, given stimuli. You've already written the rule for what that stimuli should provoke. But sometimes you you do the tried and true and it doesn't work anymore. And so you have to do some deep thinking about 
writing some new rules. So you're, you have to unlearn and you have to find a way to learn again. Right. That's interesting. Uh, how uh, Kahneman's work, uh, uh, you know, kind of parallels some of the, uh, of that thinking. I'm, um, I'm really interested uh, organizationally how quickly things calcify. <laughs> you know? Well, but I mean, isn't that, if you have that coffee shop on the way to work, where else are you going to go? Right. Um, it becomes a habit because, because I actually do believe it's an adaptive thing that we, we try to set aside things we've already thought about. Cause yes, if you didn't, is. you'd go crazy. You'd be up you'd until four nuts. in the morning thinking about right. everything. Right. I agree with you. And so the, the challenge, the grand challenge for an organization or an individual <clears throat> is when to rewrite that rule. It, you know, it it's is. having a, 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 a coffee with milk and sugar every morning, good for me, right? Okay. And, you know, why do I have that extra 10 pounds? You know what, over three years, maybe it's all the milk and sugar. And so you, you have to rewrite these rules occasionally. And, and knowing when to, when to do that is such a, that, that is wisdom. It is. The other thing I'm thinking about is, um, I'm thinking about uh, the simple rules work. Uh, who is it that did that? Simple rules. Um, so uh, what he talks about, uh, it's an, uh, an article, I think from McKinsey again. Anyway, um, is if you look at the natural world, um, complex actions take place based on simple rules. Mm -hmm. Like if you watch Skylarks, you, you watch a, a murmuration Right. And you think to yourself, how do they not bang into each other? Right. Really? Don't you? Like, I look at it. I remember being in, in Australia and there were huge remorations. Like there were these starlings everywhere and like none of them fell to the earth. Right. right. And I remember thinking, how does that happen? And it happens because they have some simple rules. Stay this far away from the, the guy next to you. If you're here, don't do, you know, it's like very simple. If only Toronto traffic was like that. Ah, <laughs> you're kidding. Oh, it's okay. We're putting in the four oh whatever. Anyway, okay. <laughs> we won't go there. That'll cure. But, um, but uh, this idea of if you have simple rules, you can do a great deal, right? So um, there's any number of natural examples, ants, for example, or fish, or fish or starlings, but there's also people. So for example, um, I was watching Maria Conde. Do you know the woman who does, does this spark joy? Oh yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, do you remember yeah. that? How do you tidy up? And she has about four rules, right? Uh, decide to tidy up, tidy up by category. Do like, it's very simple. And you look at it and you think, but that works. Like that's brilliant. That works. Or if you think about, Google and their relationship to innovation. They've always had some basic rules, like um, their first nine notions were, you, you know, you probably remember them, um, share everything you can uh, hmm. so that all information is available. Uh, everyone innovates, even the finance department, right? right. Um, you know, uh, creativity loves constraint which is a fantastic it thing. It is. Yeah, that's very useful. Very useful. But you have these notions, you have these simple rules, and within them, there's great freedom. So if a simple rule is, I need nutrients every day, that's good. Right. If your rule becomes, it's got to be a coffee with milk and sugar, that becomes rigidity. Right. Right. So organizationally, if we can think in terms of what are like five rules by which we could work this department, we would probably be in fantastic shape. <laughs> yes. Do you yeah. know what I, I got to work on those rules? <laughs> <laughs> right. So this has been fantastic. I, I just have a couple of questions left. Um, I have to ask, you have said that innovation uh is less about a business case and more about swaying hearts and minds. I do. Um, whose minds are being swayed? Like who, who is the onus on to do the swaying is, does it come from the top or, or are there skills we can learn within an organization to sway up for more 
Good. more resources? Great question. It's a great question. You know what I'm struck by? I'm struck by uh, the relationship of this question to uh, the Conference Board of Canada's um, statement that the problem with organi- uh, Canadian organizations is not that we don't have great ideas, it's that we can't sell worth a damn. Mm. Interesting. Um, right? And that, uh, so what you've captured is something which I am increasingly uh, interested in. And that is that uh, leaders of innovation in an organization, uh, a core skill they must have is the ability to influence. Right. Right. They have to be. So what does that mean? Well, it means you have to know the right people in the right place. Like you have to, uh, to be a true leader of innovation, you have to kind of be able to work across your organization and understand that while you need a business case, uh, someone else needs a sexy product right? and know how to manage those. Right. So, so I'm, I'm really interested in that, in that question. Well, uh, it, that strikes me as something that the people who often come up with the technical innovation are, are the type of people who are like, well, obviously it's better. If you don't understand that, I may as well give up. That, that there's no selling. It's just, it ought to be blindingly obvious that this is better. And so it dies on the vine. Look at what happened during COVID. Okay, uh, just, just to say this, um, the science didn't move me at all. Mm. Like the people who were making the argument, well, I, I'm interested in, inf- I'm really interested in influence. Um, they couldn't tell a good story. Uh, if it, they were paid and they couldn't tell a good story. Right. Uh, because they are driven just like, as you've mentioned, technology people are driven by the tech, by the features, by the truth of it. They're driven by the numbers. That doesn't drive me. Right. So for example, so, for example, I don't know, um, recently we had a friend over whose partner is a uh, nurse in, a neurolog- in the neurological unit of a very large complex hospital here. And um, I mean, I've heard that COVID is taking up ICU beds and people can't get stuff. I've heard that. And I, I, I go, oh, that's so bad. But listen to this. Uh, ICU beds are usually used for two to three days. And with COVID, of course, that's two to three weeks. Yeah. Okay. Number one. So you can't get a bed. You can't have the surgery. This nurse uh, works with um, uh, limbs, like limbs that have been removed. Like you got into an accident and I have to put your hand back on. And you have about two hours to get to a hospital and get that done. But with COVID, you can't do it. Hmm. So there are people who have lost limbs and are limbless yeah. because the people are in an ICU bed who maybe weren't vaccinated. All I'm saying is that's a story that pierced my heart. Yeah. Do you know, yeah. like there's a way to tell a story. So that's a very a harsh story. But what I am saying is the skill of making something vibrant and meaningful and moving is part of the skill of being a leader of innovation. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I, I can see that. You got you to make it appeal to the soul a little bit. It can't just be hard, cold, cold, I mean, cold, cold, hard numbers. Well, the, um, the uh, who is it? One of the, my colleagues says there's really three kinds of intelligences that are really important for um, someone who works in innovation. Uh, they have to have analytical skills. You have to be able to understand the business case, what, how it works, what it is. Uh, you need innovation, innovative skills, which means you have to think creatively and have a process you use and do all those things. And then you need emotional intelligence. You have right. to be able to influence. You have to tell a story. You have to understand the, um, the hearts and minds piece. Right. You have, to un- you have to be able to inhabit that person's heart and mind to know what story they, they need to hear to sway them. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Very quickly, because I know I've kept you very long. No. I don't want you to be quick. I'll ask quick. How, <laughs> how, how is, uh, how is this affecting retail? What do you, uh, I know that there's been a tsunami and now the water's rushing back, but we don't know where the new shoreline is. Where, where's the new shoreline for retail? I have no idea. I can't work it out. Um, so I wish I was ahead of the curve on this one. Uh, what uh, I do know 
is that, um, so here's what I've learned so far. First of all, if it's commodity, it is done online period. It's over. Yeah. Like, uh, so there, uh, there's no way anyone should be in a commodity business. Like that's not where things are going to live. Um, I think that some organizations have done extremely well during COVID and not only um, because of uh, an ability to um, Amazon the delivery, but also uh, in terms of their mix, what they've had, those pieces, they made it worthwhile to come in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what's going to happen with uh, technology, I think there's going to be a merger of technology and retail. Uh, and that people are going to be accessing uh, retail uh, technologically uh, and that in, in person, there'll be a technological aspect. Like there's going to be a really interesting um, merger of that, but people will be uh, drawn to, we are physical beings. We are not, retail will still happen. We still want the touch. We still want those pieces. Uh, for me, the interesting thing is going to be the interface in the physical retail space. I think that's good. Yeah, be- there's a lot of room for improve. Like, why should I have to hunt down that one kid working at Canadian Tire? Terrible. To find out where that particular bike is when I could be going to some sort of kiosk and finding that, or my phone, frankly, should tell me. Phone. Your phone. And, should- and they're starting. Like, I, I, I have to get a new recycle bin and I know exactly what aisle. It's in at my local store because of the, because of the website. So it's like a military operation. I'm just in and out. All right. Well, now you are, uh, uh, there is a gender difference. Sure. But there's also an age difference. I don't mean between us. I mean, you and I are at an age where we own pretty much everything we need. Imagine if you were in your twenties and you had to try and get everything online. Right. Right. Especially furniture. You know, you want to sit in that thing to know if it's comfortable. Right. Uh, not necessarily. Every 20 year old I know who started an apartment bought online. The same futon? <laughs> you know, just uh, just frightening, frightening. But um, but I do, I do, I am interested in how retailers are going to manage. Like I can't believe that during COVID. So let me let me just say this. Um uh, I live in a neighborhood in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And we have a couple of streets where there's there's always been great retail, local retail, small right. stores. Okay, so uh, I needed a pair of boots. I you know contacted Amazon. They sent them. They weren't the right size. I thought really I should be supporting my local guys. I went online. I ordered, and it took a month. Sure, a month yep. to deliver them. We don't and know if it's them them. though. I mean, there's all kinds of supply chain issues too, there's right? Supply chain issues for sure. But what struck me is that the BAs, the business associations for these, these two streets, for example, there's no way on earth they couldn't have set up a distribution center for everybody. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Right? Some, some like, consolidation and thinking through how we can share infrastructure. Completely. Yeah. Completely. Because the way it was done is every one of those stores had to take it, send it, get it, move it, supply chain. You know, it was a really big deal. Um, I think that as long as you have an old construct in your head, it's very hard for you to see. Right. So do you have another couple of minutes? Sure. Okay. Because that kind of innovation you're talking about really has seemed to have happened in the food space. And it's driven by these companies like Uber Eats and it's driven by innovations like ghost kitchens, right? Right. So when you're ordering a pizza now, you might think you're ordering it from the place you used to go get it, or it might be a kitchen way closer. And it's just, you know, it's lights out. All they do is make pizzas and they put them on a motorcycle and it comes to you, right? It's a very different set. It's a, the the reaction was much quicker. Why is it so much slower in retail? Uh, I'm uncertain. Other than um, I think uh, food has always had delivery and retail not. Right. Good point. Yeah. Right. Other than Amazon, Amazon, like just everybody else threw up their hands and said, I guess we can't play with Amazon. So we can't play. And I think that Walmart did and Walmart did a really good job. And I've been, I never used to get my groceries at Walmart and now I just go get it put in my trunk. Do you really? Yeah. I order everything online. 
and they put it in my trunk. I spend five minutes at the store in my car <laughs> listening to a podcast. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You do that. Um, do you know, I'm just thinking about food. Uh, the other thing that happened in a really explosive way during COVID was uh, food boxes. Oh, yeah. The the, the kits. The kits. Yeah. Um, I have become a, 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 a real fan of one of those organized, you know, one of those companies. I've tried all of them. I have the one I like every two weeks. I get a box just for, you know, it, it just offsets my cooking. But um, it is. And here's what I realized with this system. First of all, I don't have to shop. I don't have uh, excess. It's right. all controlled. It's really yeah. nice. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I'm, a, I'm quite a good cook, um, but I have learned how to do things I didn't know how to do before. It is challenging, right? Because they're completely d- d- different and, and meals they, altogether. And they have, um, uh, they make sauces in a certain kind of way. And I look at it and I go, I never would have done that, but that's delicious. That's right. So they're actually teaching me something. I love it. And think about subscription boxes for clothes, stitch, right. fix it, right? There's a, a shift taking place. It's just fascinating. Yeah, that, that's part of the, the experience economy. It is so. Right. It is. All right. So, so I, I have one last question. This has been terrific. Thank you so much, Leanne. The final question is, are companies getting better at this? They've had, they've had several years with you telling them how to do it. In general, is the is the world getting better at innovation? Oh, it's such a good question. Do you know, uh, remember, that's so interesting. I would love to think they're getting better because of me and or companies like mine, you know, or organizations <laughs> like mine. Yeah. But I'm really uh, struck by that terrific uh, meme that went around, which said, uh, was your digital strategy? <laughs> um, you know, remember? Yeah, uh, was it you? Was yeah. it your CIO or was it COVID? Was it your CEO, your CIO, or COVID? Um, so I think that we are better. Uh, I love to think it's because of education, but I think it's because of crisis. Well, I mean, to be fair, I think it's probably both. It, it's it's be, no, nothing. It, Seinfeld coming back to Seinfeld. He says, you know, you, you can't break up with a girl in one go. It's like knocking over a Coke machine. You have to <laughs> rock it a little. Right. And so the, 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 the distillation of, yes. of innovation yes. techniques okay. that you share, they may not take root immediately, but you know what, maybe, maybe it's your, the people hearing you best are the people waiting to be the next generation in charge. Right. This is very true. This is very true. And for which uh, I'm really grateful. And the thing that differentiates them is just that this intense curiosity about how things work and how they might work differently and their attachment to that idea. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful truth. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Leanne, for being on the show. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much. I was so happy to be here and it was so nice to see you. My guest today was Leanne McAleer. Leanne's LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes. My name is Tim Hampton, and you can reach me at tim at unusuallywellinformed.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you will subscribe and join me for the next show with another unusually well-informed leader in business and technology. Thank you for listening to the Unusually Well-Informed podcast. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on the Unusually Well-Informed podcast are their own and do not reflect that of their employer or any other affiliation. 